I love the kitchen. For me, it's not just a place to cook in and eat in, it's a place to live in. And maybe I shouldn't say this because I know it's a terrible cliche, but it's true. The kitchen really is the heart of the home. And what's also true for me is that it doesn't really matter whether I've got time on my hands and I can cook slowly and leisurely, or if I'm really up against it and have to do frantically fast meals. The thing is, if I'm in the kitchen, I'm happy. There's no one way of cooking any more than there's only one way of living. But as far as I'm concerned, you can't have too much food. I love thinking about food. I love cooking food. I rather like eating food. And I particularly relish coming up with a food solution, no matter the occasion. When I want to push the boat out, but I haven't got time to fuss, a low effort, high impact dinner for friends comes courtesy of my roast seafood. To keep hungry packs of marauding teenagers fed, I rely on my small pasta with salami. It's not for every day, but I believe in life. You take your pleasures where you can. So when I feel like a splurge, nothing beats my chocolate peanut butter cheesecake. My mother's praised chicken turns Sunday lunch into a family celebration. But that's not all. The leftovers make for the most fantastic Thai chicken noodle soup. But anyway, to the kitchen. When I have friends over midweek, I want supper to be simple, I want it to be stress-free, but it's still got to be a feast and it's got to be fabulous. I think of my roast seafood as something of a two-fold treat. Anyone who eats it feels spoilt, and they're right, they are being spoilt. And as for me, I'm happy and relaxed because I know how easy it is to make. It's chic, it's simple, and it's indulgent. Really, what more could one ask? So early doors, a bit of clam soaking. I soak the clams for 10 or 20 minutes just because my mother did, but really these days there's no need to. Any sand inside the clams should now go into the water. And also, if any clams do not close after they've been soaking, well, you know you ought to throw them away. And as it is, you should throw away any that are cracked now. What makes this so helpful is it's really a kind of one-pot meal. Potatoes at the base, and they've become lovely and roasted. The thick slice is unpeeled, and each slice needs to be quartered. Everybody loves roast potatoes, and also there's something so reassuring about the taste, and they make a wonderful foil for the exotic, intense flavours of the seafood. Tumble the potatoes into a roasting tin. I want the potatoes to roast and not braise, so I don't want to cram them in too tightly. On top of the potatoes, some garlic cloves. No need to peel them. Red onion. You could just as well use an ordinary, everyday yellow onion. I just feel a bit more partified using a red onion. Put these onion pieces pinkly among the potatoes. And now a lemon. I don't peel that. It is an unwax lemon, which helps. Small pieces, about a centimetre. It's got a roast in something. And that is some olive oil. Not extra virgin here, because you really won't notice it once it's roasted. And this very beautiful tray goes in a very hot oven, 220, for an hour. I want to drain the clams. Any that have stayed open at this point, you chuck away. But these are perfect. And I love the way, too, the sweetness of the clam flesh, and as well as that strong, rich liquor, just infuses the potatoes. 
The squid, well, these baby squids, certainly, are also rather sweet, but so tender as well. I want it in rings. This whole way of cooking seafood is a bit of a revelation. Normally you'd steam, say, the shellfish in a pan with some wine, and it occurred to me that actually I could use the intense heat of a hot oven instead of a pan. Just very easy, you bung everything in and it cooks. Time now for the seafood to be luxuriantly scattered over the potatoes, lemons, onions and garlic. Ah, very heady aroma. And even though this is only going to take a few seconds, I don't want the pan to lose any of its heat, so I'll just put it on a low flame for a moment and then over go the clams. And then the baby squid, just drop it in spaces. And now the prawns. There's something so ancient, so primitive about them. So we evolved and we get to eat them. And before this tray goes back in the oven, I want another glossy dribble of olive oil. and a splash, well, more than a splash, of wine. I love rosé wine and I have no time for snobs who look down on it. So back it goes in the oven for 15 minutes. Utterly gorgeous. I just want a small bit of parsley. Look at that, seafood in all its splendor. This goes beyond mere supper, this is a feast. I don't think anyone would miss this. Mm. Mm. This is my sanctuary. I always feel serene and at one with the universe when I'm surrounded by food. You may not believe this, but my children always complain that there's nothing to eat in the house. But anyway, you need a cupboard of some sort, I think, so that you can have a stash of food, so you can cook when you haven't got any time to shop. And obviously, you can't cook forever, but <laughs> actually, I can cook for an awfully long time. Pasta comes in an awful lot, and I tend to buy odd shapes when I see them. And this one I love. It's called calamari squid, and that's because you can see it looks like squid rings. And in fact, I cook it with squid rings. Just fry them in a bit of garlic oil, splosh on some white wine. That's the sauce. It's delicious. Oh, and this is so useful. The Italians call it pasta mista, and it's really bin ends. You can buy it there in packets but you can make your own very easily. Just whenever you've got maybe the leavings of some spaghetti, penne, any other shape, not quite enough to make a meal, just bung everything into a freezer bag and then beat with a rolling pin, put in a jar and use for soups or however you like. My children love this. Oh, and I adore ditalini. They like all small shapes, it's funny. Ditalini really means like little fingers, but they don't really look like that, but they are fantastic. Great in soup and great in sauces. Anyway, I know that I can come in here, grab what I've got and make supper. <laughs> My small pasta with salami is something of a house special, often needed when I have unexpected marauding teenagers. Now, salami. There is nothing to stop you using proper salami. You know, a thick sausage that you slice up and chunk. But I always have so many packets of this pre-sliced salami. We don't need any oil in here because the salami's got enough fat of its own. And I can't tell you how comforting it is for me to know that I can feed my children and their friends at a moment's notice. You know, when they were little, I arranged their play dates, but teenagers like to organise themselves, or rather disorganise themselves. I never know how many I'm going to have to feed. Can of tomatoes. Backbone for my daily cooking. 
Now, an Italian taught me that whenever you put a can of tomatoes in a sauce, you should swill out the can about half full of water. So, I do as I'm told. Here we are. Now, a bit of butter. And what I find about the butter is that it helps thicken the sauce and make it a little bit glossy. But also, tomatoes can be just that bit too bitingly acidic. I'm going to drain the cannellini beans. In they go. Now, some bay leaves, or use a bouquet garni. Now, another Italian told me that before you drain pasta, you must always remove some of the pasta water because the starch will help a sauce emulsify. Quick drainage and we're away. Right, tip it all in. Look how pretty it is. Now a bit of the pasta cooking water. Final bit of butter. And then everything is how it should be. And although no parent expects appreciation, well, you may expect it, but we don't get it, I at least know that this always goes down well. I'm going to leave it to stand for two minutes so the ditalini can absorb all that lovely tomatoey salami sauce. And then we are ready to roll. <laughs> this is not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. took on the beginning of it, took on the beginning. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> no. It's funny, when I was younger. The idea of not going out on a Saturday night seemed like the most mortifying humiliation. Now, however, just pottering about in the kitchen making a cheesecake seems like the ideal way to spend an evening. The French have a saying, everything in moderation, including moderation. So for those moments of obligatory immoderation, I have a chocolate peanut butter cheesecake. Start off by putting 200 grams just of biscuits in a processor. Of course, it's normal to have butter, and it's not a huge amount, 50 grams. But it's in moderation I'm after, delicious in moderation. And so, 100 grams of dark chocolate chips and 50 grams of salted peanuts. Just blitz these up. That's it. I'll tip this into the tin. Press in either with your fingers or using a spoon. The base is quite thick, and that's because this is so good. It's more than just the bit the cheesecake sits on. It's a major component. This just needs to be popped in the fridge while I get on with the cheesecake topping. Cheesecake needs cheese, cream cheese usually, and I want 500 grams here. It's really important to make sure that the cream cheese is at room temperature, not cold. If it's cold, you'll never get rid of that inner graininess and I want everything to be smooth. Now a luscious dollop of sour cream. And now the eggs, quite a lot of eggs here. I want three eggs. I want three egg yolks and keep the whites for another time. And now some sugar, 
200 grams of caster sugar and of course some peanut butter. I want it to be rich, fudgy and smooth. And while this combines overexcitedly together, I shall go and retrieve the base. Ah, oh, look at that. I love the way it's bubbles twinkle up. Now pour it into that chocolate marbled base. Gorgeous, golden, gleaming gloop. Right, I need it on a tray, in the oven, moderate oven, about 170 for my immoderate cheesecake, about 50 minutes, and when it's ready, the top will be set just, but underneath will be a hint of inner thigh wibble. For the topping, I'm going to melt together 250 mils of sour cream, 100 grams of really good quality milk chocolate. I normally use dark chocolate when cooking, but against the sourness of the sour cream, the milk chocolate really works. I want 30 grams of soft brown sugar, light or dark. Go gently, just swirl the melting chocolate into the cream and sugar until you have a cohesive, shiny sauce. Perfect. Those bubbles are just air bubbles. And if the surface of your cheesecake cracks, don't worry. In any case, you have got the topping. And it needs to go back in the oven, not to cook, but to set, just for 10 minutes. Well, this should keep the family quiet at Sunday lunch. I delude myself. Much as I love cooking new food, for me the real importance of home cooking is about the recipes of the past, and I don't mean historical past, I mean personal past. Chicken is very important in my family, and was when I was growing up. Uh, my grandmother used to send my mother and my aunts chickens every week, I think to compensate them for their very expensive telephone calls, since she insisted on a daily ring from all of her daughters. But of all the chicken recipes, my mother's praised chicken is the most significant. That's my mother, that's me, awfully a long time ago. When I was trying to think of what to call it, I didn't know whether to call it poached chicken or braised chicken. It's somewhere between the two, so I settled on praised. And I have to say, it feels like the right name because both cooking it and eating it feel like an act of devotion. This is how I make my mother's praised chicken. First, some oil in a pan, nice big pan, but not too deep. I use garlic oil because I don't want anything too intrusive. I just want a mellow hint of garlic. You can go on there. And now, the star. I love, respect and appreciate a chicken, but for all that, I'm gonna behave pretty brutishly to it. That sound is the sound of the breastbone being broken. I want it a bit flatter. I'm gonna continue in this sadistic vein. Cut off what I call the feet, but I think are really ankles. And now goes breast side down into the pan just to brown it a bit. Obviously, chicken, when it's not roasted, is never going to get a crisp skin, but I still want it to bronze up nicely. I don't throw things away. These bits of ankle go in the pan just to add flavour to the liquid it cooks in. I just want to turn this baby round so it's breast side up. If you've got a bottle of white wine in the house, just use a modest glassful now, otherwise some dry white vermouth. So while this bubbles up, I shall get on with the vegetables. First, carrots, in these go. Leeks, drop these in. Now some celery, in these go, and really, it seems such a waste not to use this celery leafage as well. 
but I'm not going to use the leaves of the parsley. For now, I need the stalks of the parsley. Now it's ready to be cooked, and it needs some water for that. Just pour water over. You won't be able to cover the chicken, but you should be able to cover the vegetables a lot. If I were to pour enough water to cover the chicken, there'd be so much liquid, it would never taste strong enough. And besides, this cooks with a lid clamped on, so that top, delicate part of the breast will steam and stay deliciously tender. A glistening sprinkle of salt. A couple of bay leaves. And I love these red peppercorns. But really, if you can't get them, a good grinding of regular pepper will do just fine. All I need to do now is wait for this to come to a boil. One of the many, many things I love about this is that it seems to make the chicken go so much further. So not only do I have a divine, cosy, but divine meal, but I also know I've got plenty for leftovers. This is bubbling now, so I'll turn the heat down because I want a gentle simmer. Needs about an hour and a half, an hour and 40 minutes. And one of the things I love is that even with the lid on, it scents the house so welcomingly and reassuringly. Just as I have a special way of cooking the chicken, so I have, my whole family does, a special way of eating it. I must have rice. We must have dill, a few fantastic fronds of it. And we must, I must especially, have English mustard. Perfect. I'm afraid carving doesn't run in the maternal line, so like my mother before me, I don't slice the chicken neatly, but just fork it into tender shreds. And that's the thing about chicken cooked this way, it stays so succulent. <laughs> Rice. Next chicken. And finally, vegetables and stock. Oh, it smells fantastic. Oh, I need English mustard first. It's heavenly. Heavenly. Mm. OK, ready for pudding? I'm disrobing it. Ta-da! I like the way none of us say please. <laughs> it's not when it comes to pudding. <laughs> I thought there'd be carrots in this. I thought I was going to absolutely hate this cake, but I absolutely love it. I'm so glad you said that. I was waiting on the hooks. There's something so great about going out and then knowing you're going back to a fridge that's full of fantastic leftovers that you just need to zhuzh up a bit and then have a fantastic dinner. Right, I think I'll be needing this too, please. My 70 plates. Okay. There are times when I need food that's spicy, but also soothing. And boy, is this one of those times. Okay. Oh, coriander. Now, the noodles are upon me, but first, please, oh, come down a bit in the world, but comfort. I love these bean thread noodles, they're so pretty. And, oh, I've had enough now, that's almost boiling. You just need to soak them, you don't even need to cook them. This is my Thai chicken noodle soup, invented for just such occasions as these. Some chicken stock. And just while it comes to a boil, I'm going to wrestle with a can of coconut milk. 
don't know what I'm doing. Nothing very much is the answer. Oh. <laughs> it's, I'm gonna get there, I am. See, look, resistance is futile. Bit of ginger, I think. You can slice it, you can grate it, you can do whatever you want, but I love the spicy warmth. Want some fish sauce? I need the power of tanginess. And while we're on tang, oh, some tamarind paste, lovely and sour. Mm, look at it go. And some turmeric, because this turns everything fabulously golden. And a squirt of lime. And last, in my comfort cauldron here, some brown sugar. Just really to balance the fish sauce, the tamarind and the lime. And now we may proceed. The joy of leftovers. I mean, not that you need to use leftovers. You can use cold cooked chicken that you just bought or actually prawns, anything. This can't be bad. And now this is going to be difficult, but I will attempt it. You've got to take risks in life. My noodles, look at them. Beautiful. A bit jellyfishy, I know, but there's something, they look like they're lit up by moonlight. In they go. And the vegetables. Look at this, bit of a stir fry, only no frying, no stirring. Even better. Normally I'd have put some chilli pepper in here, but because this mixture came with some in it, I'm spared. Not that it's hard work, but still. Use my tamarind spoon <laughs> to give this a bit of a stir. And while the vegetables cook, well, wilt a bit, I can chop my coriander. Well, you know what? I need to disrobe. Oh. Carpet at the top with a bit of coriander. This should restore a bit of equilibrium. Mm. Mm, very happy. 